The seven angels. Let's, let's talk about the difference between an angel and an archangel. The word angel simply means messenger. Sorry, that's it. And naturally, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out who it's a messenger to and from, because they all come from God, basically, unless it happens to be one of the bad ones. And unfortunately, that's called a fallen angel, and they're straight from Satan. But it simply means a messenger. Now, if we put the word ark before it, we have archangel, which means what? Chief. Or um, a, a order of rank it means a very important angel, a very important messenger. So when one of them speaks, you want to pay attention because God only utilizes them to deliver messages. The first time that the seven archangels are mentioned, special angels, whatever you wish to, term it, the, to uh, call them, is mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. And they continue basically then throughout the book of Revelation. So they are very special angels. Now, the problem that was happening in the eighth chapter of Ezekiel, the church had gone to pot. I mean, the sanctuary was filthy. Well, let, let's just open our Bibles to Ezekiel uh, chapter 8. Let's pick it up with verse 6. So, I mean, you might look around yourself today and see how, how this con condition compares to churches around the world today. And this is, incidentally, this is our Father. He is present on earth at the time of this teaching. As you know from the book of Ezekiel, his throne was aboard the craft. And it reads here as he continues, as he rises up, and he speaks, our Father himself, in verse 6 of chapter 8, Ezekiel. What, what does Ezekiel mean in the Hebrew tongue? El strengthens. God strengthens you if you'll listen to him. Okay, verse 6 reads, He said, Furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? Look, look what they're doing in those churches. Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. I should leave that church. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. And then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abomination that they do here. So I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping thing and abominable beast and all idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Now, God will not be mocked and God will not put up with traditions of men in his house or he cuts himself away from it just simply wants nothing to do with it. Skip on, if we may, for the sake of time, to, to verse 14. And he brought me into the door of the gate of the Lord's house. It's the Lord's house, supposed to be. Which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. And that's the sprout of life, fertility rituals. I don't have to tell you what those were. They had to do with fertility eggs and rabbits and stuff like that. Uh, surely in this modern day we wouldn't have anything like that in the churches, would we? I, I, I would pray not. Verse 15, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, the door of the temple of the Lord, and between the porch and the altar were five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. They had their back to the altar. They're supposed to be elders and their faces toward the east and they worship the sun toward the east. It's well to understand the sun, the moon, and the stars, but don't ever worship them. That's a no-no. 
And um, then he continues, then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. That's to say the Asherah. The Asherah is, well, it has to do with male gender, okay, in part. The 18, therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither shall I have, will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. I'm going to tell you something. Our father in this generation of the fig tree is not happy with so-called churches that do not teach his word, that rather bring forth traditions of men. Now, let me ask you a question. We read these scriptures. Did God take Ezekiel down to a local pub and say, look what they're doing in this pub? Or did he go off to some heathen nation and say, look at these abominations? No, he went to the church and said, look at the abominations. I don't want you to lose sight of that. It's important to this lecture. Now, what does he do about it? And thus enters seven angels. Chapter 9, verse 1. And he cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. They better be ready for war. God's got a surprise for them. Verse 2. And behold, six men. The word men here is Enosh. They're supernatural entities. They are angels. Six special angels came from the way of the higher gate. Do you know what the higher gate is? Okay. Which lieth toward the north, every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them, making seven, and this man Ish, not Enosh, Ish, among them was clothed with linen with a rider's ink horn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. I mean, we're, we're right in the house of God by the brazen altar. These are seven archangels, meaning simply of a higher rank, if you like. Special. God utilizes them in many ways. And I'm going to tell you something. I'll give you a little clue starting out. Basically always to do with the church. And the church had better wake up. I'm speaking of church in general around the world as to what they're teaching and what they're doing. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub. Whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. He takes a great interest in this. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn by his side. For, and the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Now, that is a seal that does what? It is a, why were they crying because of the abominations? Because they were repulsive. Couldn't handle it. It was an abomination. Do you think God doesn't know and has a mark in the mind of those that know and search the true word? the right chronology of what God, our Father, has said events transpire. Do you think God doesn't know you? Do you think he's angry at you? No, he's angry at the thing that is abominable. He loves you. You have nothing to fear. Why? You're his child. And you know better. That's why he wants you marked, because he's about to turn his wrath loose upon the heathen, Upon the bar down the street? No, the church. 
that misteaches, the church that misleads, the church that does not assist the man with the ink horn, that is to say to, to fix in the mind the truth of God's word, that ink horn is on the pages of your word. That ink horn that transfers God's truth into your mind. That ink horn that has been around forever. Placing the seal of God in the foreheads of those that care. Those that realize they were created for God's pleasure and that those that work at being a pleasure to God. Verse 4, And the Lord said unto him, Go, th oh, we'll go through the midst, we got that, okay. And five, and to the others he said in mine hearing, go ye after him throughout the city and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my church, my sanctuary, then they begin at the ancient men which were before the house. They're supposed to know better. What kind of death is this? What's the opposite of learning, of the ink horn, the writing, the high priest, the linen? The opposite of truth is spiritual death. Deader than a hammer spiritually. I'm going to tell you something. The weapon they carried was the weapon of deception that God allows to come upon the world for those that don't care what happens in the sanctuary, that's to say God's house, that it is God's house, therefore God's word should be taught there and not man's. The seven do a nice job throughout time. This mark is still very applicable to this day. And it carries, as we're going to learn, throughout the Word of God. I don't know. I hope you got it. If you don't, you're in trouble. I know if you're here, you do. And so our Father is not looking for people to zap. He's simply looking for those that zap themselves. Why? They don't care. You don't have to look very far in this world today to find people that even mock religion. God will not be mocked. And we're coming on that time where he will document it for many and he will start with the churches. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go you forth. And they went forth and slew the city. I mean, the truth. If they didn't want the truth, he will see to it they don't get it. If they want it, they're marked. And it came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried, and I said, O oh Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Are you going to destroy them all? Then he said unto me, The iniquity, the sin, of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perversiveness. You think the cities are not full of perversiveness today and it's, it's even very uncouth for you to even say something about perverted. It's not in. We're supposed to love the perverted. It's just not right for you to say anything against the perverted. You're supposed to welcome them in. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. Oh, he sees it. Don't be afraid to stand up for what is right. You're salty. You make a difference. You know, I guess we could say it's none of our business what people do in private, but don't flaunt it in front of me. I guarantee it wouldn't be safe for you. Like it, lump it, or put it in between. That's the way it goes. That's the way it is. And that's the way God feels about it. I don't care whether it's politically correct or not. God hates perversiveness. Well, brother, what, what, what is perversiveness? Anything that isn't natural the way God created it. 11, 10. 
And as for me also, mine eye shall not spare, neither shall I, will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. I'm going to give them everything they got coming to them all at one time. 11, and behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the ink horn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. That was the reason. I've marked them. There is coming a time when that marking shall be completed. We're kind of in the middle of it now. We're kind of still marking. We're still teaching. We're still bringing that same inkhorn message from off the very pages of God and distributing that message around the world. That is to say, the churches that are faithful. There's still some of them out there. But recognize the abomination when you see it. Uh, let's go, speaking of marking, let's go to Revelation, the book that many churches would teach you're not supposed to understand. Well, it's strange that the word revelation means to reveal. And if it means to reveal or uncover a bright person, certainly a child could understand it. Chapter 7, verse 1, the great book of Revelation. What about this sealing and marking? Verse 7, chapter 7, rather, verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels, four symbolic of the earth, north, east, south, and west, getting ready. A wind that closes on all point, uh, from all directions that sit, hits on one point. That's God's way of saying destroy. Standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind might not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor on any tree, to bring to pass the end. Two, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, the ink horn. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. What's in your forehead? Your mind. What does it mean, the seal of God? Well, God's word, the truth. That that the ink corn brings forth for you to absorb a letter written to you from the Father, from the altar, telling you how to conquer this world how to be a champion of your people, how to, how to take names and kick dragon when it comes to someone messing with your family. That's what it's about. He said, don't let the, why, why, is he, why is he saying this? Well, the election, the generation of the elect would be the final generation. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. They have to be in place and every soul must be born to woman through this earth age. But that time is approaching, I assure you. And that's the ceiling. There was 144,000. That doesn't have anything to do with how many people have salvation. To document that, skip to verse uh, 9. And after this, after the ceiling... After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, and people, and tongues stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. What do the white robes signify? They overcame. That's your grandparents that have loved Jesus and have passed on in with him. They're there now. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. That's, that's the thing. Listen carefully. Verse 12. Saying, Amen. Blessings, one. And glory, two. And wisdom, three. And thanksgiving, four. And honor, five. And power, six. And might, seven. Be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Who are they? And whence came they? Where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. 
And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation on earth, of course, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Mean they were saved by Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus the Christ. It, they're, they're, it is a number that cannot be counted, that have already overcome and are with him and are wearing the white robes which is woven together from their righteous acts upon this earth. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. He's there. And he's looking forward to the time that he can dwell with all his children on earth, as it is written. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them. Unto, their, unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. It's important that you grasp that scripture, and the reason we went that far, who does the feeding? The lamb. Who, does the, who, is the, who is he that puts forth the ink of the sealing? That is to say, the matter that goes into your mind, that feeds your mind, where that you know truth from fiction. It's the Lamb. He is the way. He is the path. Quite frankly, He's the only way. Period. The millennium will be the equator of many things, a time of teaching and learning. And by the end of the millennium, all will have learned this or they will no longer be with us. So, there we have the sealing. Just as the seven angels did in the Old Testament. And so it is. Go back to the first chapter of this great book of Revelation with me. And listen carefully. Now, keep up or you're going to miss some of the better part of this, all right? Keep up. Chapter 1, verse 16. Christ has appeared to John on the Lord's day, which is the millennium, taking him there to show him what would befall us in the end times. And, he's, and here he stands, verse 16, the, uh, Christ. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. What comes out of the mouth of Christ? His tongue, of course. It's his word. And the truth will cut. It has two edges. You can cut anybody down that stands in lies with truth. Just prior to this, he, would have in the, he was, uh, stood in the midst of seven candlesticks. Ooh, symbolism. He uses symbolism to simplify Verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And beloved, he says that to you today as you look around you at the turmoil. Fear not. God's not angry at you. He's angry at the abomination and those that participate therein. Verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. They crucified me. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. That's that. That's what the word amen means. And have the keys of hell and death. I don't know. Do you want out? He's got the key. The key of truth. The key of David unlocks the very gates. And you have freedom in truth. The truth will set you free. Now, why is it some people worry with the book of Revelation? Listen to me carefully. 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. You give them the whole chronological order of events. They'll be able to understand. And then he says, let me simplify it for you. Verse 20. The mystery 
of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels. There's your seven angels again. Isn't that deep? It isn't at all. It's simple. He teaches so children can understand. The, the stars are the angels of the seven churches. Stay sharp for me. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Don't ever think that God isn't interested in those that go under the name church. Because they're supposed to represent him. I don't know, if someone represents you, aren't you a little careful how much rights you give them to say what about you and your business? Okay. Do you think some attorney allows the janitor to give legal advice on weekends over his telephone? I don't think so. And I'm not mocking the janitor. He's probably sharper than the attorney is. Okay? He knows how to make an honest living. Uh, and God bless the, all you attorneys here. You know I'm teasing. Okay. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Here again are those seven angels, all right? And, and that's, that's all they are, messengers. Me brother, messengers to who? The churches. Are they going to listen? That's the point. The seven angels. Let's go to Revelation chapter, where do I want to go? Well, I, 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 I want to go to chapter 5 and listen carefully. Chapter 5 of Revelation stipulates, I mean, we got seven angels, we got seven churches, and here we go with something else. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. There's that number again, seven seals. Uh, and I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? This is what's supposed to go into your mind, friend, for you to carry the mark. It's very important. And it's stressing that this is one of the super archangels. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. I'm going to tell you something. It won't do you a lick of good to study God's word unless you know Christ and that he is in you. He will open it to your mind whereby you receive the seal. Otherwise, you're dead wood in the water, just floating. Verse 4, And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, you don't have to worry. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. I don't know how many of them have you got. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and, of the midst, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. There's only one, friend having seven horns and seven eyes. Do you fit in that category to be an assistant? Which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. To what? Teach, of course. From what? The Word. And he, and he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials full of otas, which are the prayers of saints. Do you think your prayers are lost? They're bottled. He remembers every one of them. If you're a saint, okay? If you're one of God's elect, otherwise guess where they are. Nine. And they sang a new song, saying... Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, how many, and tongue, and people, and nation made it possible, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. When? The millennium. Or even now in your home and in your life, you're the captain of your ship. 
steer it well and keep it on course. It, you know, in James there is a passage that speaks of a great ship in a storm and just a little, that, uh, just a, a little tiller or rudder. But understand this, it's the helmsman that, the, that centers on the action. The helmsman, that's you. You have, to, you have to steer the boat and steer a straight course because the seas are going to get rough in your lifetime. And you're going to have some bumps in the road. You've got to learn how to, to um, overcome the adversary by the power that you have inherited from your father, rightfully so. No big deal, all right? Um, verse 11, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's a Hebraism. Let me explain it to you. That is a Hebraism or a figure of speech that means you can't count them, all right? They're uncountable. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive, what? Power, one. And riches, two. And wisdom, three. And strength, four. And honor, five. And glory, six. And blessing, seven. The seven spirits of God, how precious. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are such as are in the sea. And all that are in them hear, heard I saying, blessing, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Hey, he's still sitting there, the Lamb sitting beside him. They even know what you're thinking right now. They care. They really care. They love you. They may not love what you do all the time, but they do love you. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him. Not the Son, but him that liveth forever and ever. Now we come to a very important part. It is important that now that we know that um, the Lamb was given authority to release the seals. Now, you have seven things. You have seven seals. You have seven trumps. And you have seven vials. And you've got seven angels. Now, what are the seals? There's a difference in these things. The seals are exactly what he called them, the seal in your forehead. The seals only teach you what the action is going to be that follows with the trumps. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think the angels release the seals? No, no. I went to a great deal of trouble and reread stuff that most of you know by heart so that you know who it is that opens the seals. It's not an angel. Not one of the seven angels. For that reason, chapter 6, we follow verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Who opened it? Not an angel. This is the only way you can learn. It's through the Lamb. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. What was the first thing the lamb pulled forth out? It's, this is not the chronological order. But he considered it to be the most, the very most important for you to know, to have sealed in your mind. I'm only going to cover the first seal. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow. Toxin in the Greek, a fabric cheap imitation of the prism that stands around God's throne and a crown was given to him claiming to be their Lord of Lords and he went forth conquering and to conquer. He's going to do it. The first thing, the seal in your mind that separates you from the ignorant or those that don't know 
is that the false Messiah comes first, riding a white horse exactly the way it's pictured that Christ does in the 18th and 19th chapter of this same book. Okay, so what have we learned here? Angels do not teach. Only the Lamb sets the seal in your forehead. The angels do sound the trumpet. And that that you have sealed in your forehead will begin to come to pass and you are to recognize it as it does. That's important, beloved. Never expect to learn anything except through the Lamb because only He can touch your mind and give you the wisdom through the touch of the Holy Spirit. For after all, is it not the Holy Spirit that will speak through you and you're supposed to keep your little old mind still and not even premeditate what you'll say beforehand. But it takes faith to do that because most of us think we're pretty sharp. I'll show him. Just wait till I get before Satan. I've got things to tell him. Don't be stupid. Listen to your father and learn from his word. You all know where I'm quoting, and for the new student, I will say, I'm quoting from Mark chapter 13 when you're delivered up, that you're not to premeditate what you say, but to allow him, the Lamb, the Holy Spirit, to speak through you, that the truth can be heard by all people. Okay, let's turn over to chapter 8. Let's look at the trumps for a minute, you know, so we can kind of keep this going in our minds here. And when he had opened the seventh seal, who's the he? The lamb, of course. When the lamb had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. You know why there's silence in heaven? That's the last hour and Satan and his angels are booted out. It doesn't say anything about earth. Okay? Because all heck will be cutting loose down here for some people, not us. Verse 2. And I saw the seven angels. Here we go. The boys are ready. The same seven we read of in Ezekiel. The seven angels which stood before God and to them were given the seven trumpets. They're going to get to do this. What, what does an army do when it sounds an attack? The trumpet blows. And wherever you are in the field, you know, all right? That's the point. Verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Again, God hears your prayers if you're one of his elect. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar. Where, I mean, we're talking high cotton here, friend. We're talking about the altar of the living God. And cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake and the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. The first angel and on through goes all the way back through the 11th chapter. And finally, the seventh sounds. Action! We got one other thing, though, that we got to cover here, and that's, that's the vials. Turn with me to the 15th chapter of this book. You all know that chronologically here, the beast is overcome in the 15th chapter. But chronologically, it hasn't because this, there is one ingredient that is left out. We had the action, but our Father, what belongs to God? Vengeance. He is angry, and he's not going to be satisfied. I mean, how would you like it if you had a bunch of little old kids and some brood on the block comes along and straps them all and bad mouths them and beats them about and takes advantage of them, takes their money through usury. 
I mean, the little things can't think too good for themselves. They get all involved in usury <laughs> and get lost in the ways of the world. You'd be angry at them a little bit, would you not? Naturally, you wouldn't raise a hand against them, but you might a foot, okay, whatever. He's angry. He doesn't like it when people pick on his kids, and his kids are crying to him. That's why those prayers are held, so that he gets even, okay? Now, perhaps I'm making that sound as though his vengeance is for a negative purpose. There's nothing negative about God. It's just that some people have to have an attitude adjustment they won't forget, so that in the millennium, maybe, they'll love him. And there's a purpose for everything. But you reap what you sow. Okay, that's the, that's the way God operates. If they sow abomination, boy, this is what they collect. Revelation chapter 15, verse 6. Verse 6. And the seven angels, oh, here they are. The seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. Oh, I look forward to that. But anyway, seven. And one, I'm, that's for the angels, not us. I'm jesting a little bit. I'm just making sure you're awake because the best is yet to come, all right? I want you to be sharp. Seven. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of what? Full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man, no how, no way, I'll add, was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. In other words, this goes all the way through to the end of the millennium where those, those heaven is sealed. If, you, if, they, if it's too late, Charlie. They have to be taught through that time and be tested by Satan. Chapter 16, verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first wind he poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous, grievous sore upon men, which had, the, which had the mark of the beast, not God's mark, but were deceived, and upon them which worshipped his image. And there you got it. The lamb has the seals held out to you today. He paid a, why did it say he was worthy? Because he was slain. He did that for you. That if you search prayerfully, he's going to touch you. And even the most difficult scriptures are going to come into your mind. Where did he say to start the correction in his church? And start with the head mud up preachers, all right? Start with those boys and ladies that claim to be teachers. Start with them. And if they've misled or allowed abomination into my house, I'd hate to be in their shoes, my friend. You know, as you teach classes, you always pray for guidance from the Father that you don't mislead someone. That should be your prayer before you, every lecture, every study, that you don't hurt someone or mislead someone, that you're able to see the truth. And God will always bless you in that. Well, how, can we, how, how can we sum all this up? Well, um, who... Let's, let's, let's go, uh, you know, what can we, some teachers teach that after the third chapter in this book of Revelation, the church is gone, Whew. zipped out of here, 
absolutely disappeared in the night, and I'm sorry, you saints are going to be left behind. Okay. Now, of course, a fifth grader can read chapter four, um, five, four or five, which is it? Four. Where John says, come on up here, they, he says to John. And it was John that was taken up, not the church. You know, there's a lot of difference between, John isn't the one Christ said, I'm going to build my church on you, John. He didn't say that, it was Peter. But, and the church is also mentioned in the 22nd chapter. But you see, we've, we've been doing this study for a, a kind of a, I'm not going to call it a devious purpose but a purpose that kind of nails the truth to the barn house door, you know, that kind of lets us know who's who and who. God wants to start with the church. If it's gone, how, he, he's got a stinking mess like that with him in heaven? I don't think so. I don't think he wants it there. So let's go back to chapter 1. Chapter 1. in Revelation, verse 20. And let's, let's absorb, thinking about the seven angels here, verse 20 says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now let that sink in. Who are they the angels of? The churches. Now, if the churches are gone, pray tell me. What are those seven angels to the churches doing monkeying around with chapters 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, and on 15, and on through? If the church is gone, they'd be kind of deceived, would they not? I mean, you know, if the church is gone, I'm sure they'd be gone. But God doesn't want a half-baked church would not have it in heaven, nor will he enter it on earth. Naturally, the seven angels are pouring their wrath, not out on some beer hall. Not to, not, I don't think I'm building up beer halls, all right? I'm, I'm not. I'm just saying that's not, God's not as mad at them as he is some preacher that'll say, you don't have to worry about God's word. Listen to me. You're going to fly away, okay? Whether it's biblical or not, it doesn't matter, you know, to him. Long as you'll please hit the, you know, start the music and pass the plates. Do something religious, you know. That's what they're mainly interested in. Don't kid yourself, okay? You know, and it is, it's money. You don't have to listen to them very long to find out. But again, naturally, the seven angels all the way from Ezekiel and throughout Revelation are the seven angels of the churches, and I guarantee you the church is still here, or they wouldn't be out there teaching and pumping and correcting, because they start with the church. They couldn't start with the church if the church was already gone. Now, now that we have that all figured out, I've got the four W's, who, what, when, and where, and one of my mentors told me one time, when you cover those four things, sit down and shut up. Okay? You're through. So I guess I'm through. But I think that's important, beloved. I'm just going to recap, and then I'm going to do exactly as he said. I'm going to close this lecture. This, point one. Only the Lamb... No angel, no one else, only the Lamb can bring the seal or the truth into your mind. So you want to talk to him and read his writings. They're important. His advice, his counsel. Number two, no angel can release those seals to you. Be careful. And number three, the seven angels are strictly to the church. 
and many might say, well, what about everybody else? Well, they kind of got to get into the real church or they're not going to be anyway. You understand? In other words, they're going to be a part of God's church or they're going to be in hell, one or the other. That's by the time the end of the millennium. God's got a lot of patience. His church is a little different maybe than some view it. But that's who those seven angels are for. So stay in the field, the world, and keep doing his work until the seventh trump is sounded by the seventh angel. And then you'll know that Messiah has returned. And uh, we still have work to do even after that. But he loves those that he finds working in the field when he returns. There's a special crown for that. And I trust that you wear it. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the word. We thank you, Father, for the seal, the truth, Father. We thank you for the Lamb, Lord, that paid the price for us. We ask forgiveness and service in his service. In Jesus' name, amen. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you, one time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the mark of the beast. Okay, and we'll get into some questions here. And we've got R.D. from Texas. Do you think uh, putting animal parts in cattle feed is akin to cooking a calf in its mother's milk. Uh, an interesting thought. Naturally, the reason you are told not to cook, boil a calf in its mother's milk is it's double insult to the animal, all right? Uh, but in a sense, I see where you're coming from. But the mad cow disease is brought forth by taking animal parts, creating protein from them, and putting it back into the feed and feeding it to the animals. It drives them mad. Why? It's not natural. Anything you do that is contrary, what is a cow supposed to eat? Grass or grain, all right? Organic matter, just like we do. Uh, only we turn a little carnivore as God has allowed certain animals. But anytime you do something unnatural, it'll bring forth a disease. That's the way God created us. That's why his rules apply. That whole, a lot of people will say, well, I thought his health laws were done away with. Huh, no, he created these flesh bodies. What makes you think for one minute that what would make these flesh bodies sick 2,000, 3,000 years ago or more wouldn't still make them sick today because they haven't changed. Naturally, God, in as much as he created them, he knows what is good for them. You pervert anything away from the natural use and you've got disease, all right? And it's a pitiful sight to see a cow suffering with that mad cow disease. It's pitiful. It's pitiful to see human beings that pervert themselves, to see them dry up and shrivel away like an old prune. Kind of sad. Franklin from Indiana. I heard you the other day say we should have silver coins and precious metals set back for when... 
the false Messiah is on earth. Should I cash in savings and pinch? No, 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 no. I never give financial advice, all right? And hey, uh, I don't want to take away from the fact that God takes care of his own. All I suggested was that just a little bit of precious metal is never a bad thing to have. It's good to barter with. And, but for heaven's sakes, don't go into it uh, like putting all your eggs in one basket. That would be silly. We've got a long ways to go. So ease your pack down, take five, and enjoy the ride. Bobby from California, from Georgia. How long will the Christians stay on earth during the tribulation? Well, unless you die, the whole thing. All of it. You know, what is the, there are two tribulations, number one. And I think I, in as much as you say the tribulation rather than plural, the first tribulation as it is written in Mark 13 comes by the, from the false messiah. The second tribulation, which do we have to worry about it? Absolutely not. That's what we're here for, is to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us before the false messiah and, and let our brethren hear the truth. They're finally going to hear it for one and all times. It is written in Luke chapter 21 that even the gainsayers will be convinced by what you say at that time. So I don't call that tribulation. I consider that pleasure for it is <clears throat> for that reason that we're brought here. I'm talking about God's election, those that have eyes to see and ears to hear and that know the truth. <clears throat> and of course, the second tribulation is brought on by our Father through the Son. We don't have to worry about that tribulation being right here. He's not mad at us. He's angry at our enemies, and woe be unto them at that time. But we haven't got anything to worry about. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.